So our speaker tonight is Chloe Michaels. Chloe is a PhD student from Stanford University uh, with the Hopkins Marine Station in Monterey, even though uh, she is now currently uh, still in North, North Carolina due to COVID. Um, I'm sure she will love, you know, the beautiful uh, Monterey, uh, Monterey Bay Area. And kudos to Koei as a recent recipient of the Stanford Graduate Fellowship. Uh, Chloe received her BS in Animal Science from Cornell U University, where she studied evolutionary biology in songbirds. She has studied birds in Kenya and Australia. Tonight, she will share with us her research close to home on Song Sparrow of the San Francisco Bay. So a very well walk, welcome to Chloe. So thank you all um, so much for having me here today. This is really a special opportunity for me um, for several reasons. First, I've been studying the song sparrows of the San Francisco Bay for several years, but from the Lab of Ornithology in Ithaca, New York. And now I'm actually a first year PhD student at Stanford. Um, also, my advisor at the Cornell Lab, Irby Lovett, had his very first field experiences in ornithology in middle school through SFBBO. So I really feel like this has come full circle for me, and I'm really excited to share my work with you today. But before I get into the talk, I first want to thank SFBBO for this opportunity. Um, I especially want to thank my research mentors, Jen Walsh and Irby Lovett, and all members of the Lovett Lab for their guidance over the years. I also want to thank Yvonne Chen and Peter R. Cease, who originally conducted the fieldwork in the San Francisco Bay and who helped guide me in my research, as well as my graduate student mentor, Stephanie Aguillon, who is joining me at Stanford as a postdoc, and Fred Benham, who is another Sparrow enthusiast, both Stephanie and Fred will be giving talks to you in the coming months, so keep an eye out for those. And then last but not least, Jillian Dittner, who did the beautiful illustrations that you'll see in my talk today. I want to take a minute to especially thank my advisor, Jennifer Walsh, as my work is just a small part of her much larger endeavors studying salt marsh adaptation and songbirds. I was very fortunate to take a class with Jen at the Lab of Ornithology in my freshman year at Cornell. And one day, Jen asked us, she asked our entire class, if anyone was interested in research. And to my luck and to my surprise, I was the only one who raised my hand. And Jen blindly took me in and taught me everything that I know about research in ornithology. She not only introduced me to the world of these fascinating little brown birds that we know as song sparrows, but also to the world of research. She's shown me that you can not only be an amazing scientist, but also an amazing mother at the same time. I don't know how she does it all. And I'm so thankful to have her as a role model and a mentor. So a little bit of background about me. Uh, my fascination with birds and with the natural world began at a very early age, um, even earlier than this in the pictures, but these were the earliest digital photos that I could find on my mother's Facebook page. I grew up in North Carolina where my parents couldn't keep me inside. I spent my weekends filling the bird feeders with my dad, and soon enough, we had cameras in our nest boxes, and we were watching these birds 24-7 on our TV inside. So I decided to go to Cornell for my undergrad, where my childlike fascination with the outdoors matured into a directed passion for research, but the excitement has remained the same. But research wasn't what I had always dreamed of doing. And for any younger members in the audience, I feel that I should mention that what you think is your dream career is subject to change, and that's okay. I went to Cornell thinking that I was going to be a veterinarian. That's what I thought I was going to do ever since I was a young girl. It was the only real career that I knew of that involved working with animals. I actually had to take a class at Cornell that was teaching us about different careers in animal science, and I thought that it was the biggest waste of time because I was so certain that I was going to be a vet. But here I am, a grad student at Stanford and not planning on going to vet school. But I very quickly fell in love with the world of research. And I learned about different careers where I can still work with animals, 
and learn from the natural world every day. And I was very fortunate that as an undergrad, I had the opportunity to do a lot of really fun field work, like chasing lyrebirds through Australia and going to Kenya. Um, and that made the decision to pursue a career in research a no brainer. But if you know me now and you happen to come across any of my social media, you might be confused because it's literally filled with pictures of fish. I'm currently a first year PhD student at Stanford's Hopkins Marine Station, where I'm not studying seabirds, um, but bluefin tuna migrations through electronic tagging. So our paths in life, in, in life and what we end up doing may not always be what we expect. But today I'm really excited because I get to tell you all about the song sparrows and what I learned through studying them from an evolutionary biology perspective. Though we think of these birds as common, today I'm hopefully going to show you why the song sparrows of the San Francisco Bay in particular are anything but your ordinary backyard bird. In addition to being one of the most familiar songbirds, the song sparrow is one of North America's most abundant and adaptable bird species. There are 52 named and 25 recognized subspecies of song sparrow. As you can see from this map on the right, they occupy very diverse habitats all across North America, from the East Coast to the Aleutian Islands and Mexico. So you'll be hearing me refer to subspecies quite often throughout this talk. And what even is a subspecies? There are frequent debates in naming and subspecies designation. Some taxonomists think subspecies shouldn't even exist at all, whereas others want to name every discrete population. But before we go into subspecies, how do we even define a species? And how is this different from a subspecies? So one important thing to note is that speciation is a gradual evolutionary process. And biological species are typically defined as the basic unit of classification, a grouping of individuals and populations of individuals that share similar traits, a history of recently shared ancestors, and that can fully interbreed with one another. So a subspecies is then defined as an even smaller unit, a distinct population or a group of populations within a more widespread species that is distinguishable from other subspecies on the basis of one or more traits, such as plumage, behavior, or a geographic region. And there are often many disagreements on how these are grouped and when a subspecies deserves promotion to its own species. And that helps us to understand why in the song sparrow, which is so widely distributed, how there have been 52 named subspecies, but only 25 that are formally recognized. The song sparrow and all of its subspecies are incredible complex to study as a biologist because we are able to evaluate the role of the evolutionary forces that result in population differences. They're one of the most highly variable species in North America, and there are large differences in size, coloration, and song. One of the most stark subspecies differences can be found just on the west coast of the United States. These images here are to scale. Birds living in Alaska and in the Aleutian Islands, such as the subspecies Maxima, are some of the largest, with extremely long bills and tails, and weighing around 50 grams. And then you get the subspecies in the San Francisco Bay, which are among the smallest, weighing in at about 15 to 20 grams. They're not even half the size of the Alaskan birds. They have much shorter bills and tails, and as you can see, quite different plumage as well. So the questions that are interesting to me and to my lab group at Cornell are what causes genetic variation, especially between subspecies? Well, it can broadly be grouped into two categories, neutral processes, by which genetic drift or random changes in allele frequencies over time cause variation, or adaptive, adaptive processes, where natural selection for beneficial traits results in populations becoming different over time. However, there are very strong evolutionary forces that act against this and counter it. The basics of population genetics theory tells us that one migrant per generation keeps divergence away. So just one migrant bird in one generation prevents populations from becoming different. And this is called gene flow, which homogenizes populations. It makes them the same. It reduces diversity. And in many species, but especially in birds, such as the song sparrow, that are mobile and can fly over most geographical barriers that would otherwise separate populations like plants, gene flow is an extremely strong force that counters genetic variation. So with all that in mind, now let's zoom into the San Francisco Bay. This is a region you all know much better than I do. And though I don't yet have the personal on the ground experience, 
I've spent a lot of time thinking about this place through the lens of the song sparrows that live here. And I really think of this region as a natural laboratory to study evolutionary biology. Now, while traffic and urban sprawl might make, the, might make this box here seem very large to you, it's an extremely small region to hold six different named subspecies of song sparrow. Just for some perspective, there are three subspecies on the entire East Coast, and there are six in this 70 by 100 kilometer region surrounding the Bay Area. And the subspecies here can generally be split up into two groupings, one that lives in the upland region, and these birds are colored in red, and one that lives in tidal marshes, and these birds are colored in blues. So now I'll spend a little bit of time introducing these birds to you, even though you probably already know them, um, and the, as well as their habitats. So first we have our upland group, which spans the coastal uplands like Point Reyes, which should here, and freshwater riparian zones that are more inland and even into the Central Valley. So first we have Gouldii, which resides in these coastal uplands, and there are even freshwater marshes there where they live, and Kirmani, which lives in the freshwater riparian zones, a little bit to the east of the bay. And then there's a third putative subspecies, which is considered to be a hybrid of the two. Um, but it's not one of those that's officially named. The rest of the five are, but Santa Cruces is the only one that's named, but not recognized. Sorry. And we just have one illustration to represent all of these upland freshwater birds, um, because they all look pretty similar. And then the second habitat type is the salt marshes of the San Francisco Bay, which is the largest estuary on the west coast of the United States. In the San Francisco Bay marshes, ocean water meets freshwater to form an estuary which is an essential ecological zone. And salt marsh is a transition between water and dry land, and it's subject to flooding when the tide comes in. So when a song sparrow is building their nest in the marsh, these nests may be lost and drowned from flooding, or nestlings could be lost to predators like foxes. It's an extremely difficult place to live in. And for each arm of the San Francisco Bay, there's one endemic resident song sparrow subspecies a different subspecies for each arm of the bay. And what makes these birds so special is that they are the only song sparrows that live full time in saltwater marshes. And therefore they have interesting adaptations that allow them to survive here. First, we have Samuelas in San Pablo Bay. We have Maxillaris in Sassoon Bay and Pusalula in the South San Francisco Bay. And even though their distributions are quite small and highly localized, these subspecies are remarkably distinct. If you look closely, you can start to see the differences. Maxillaris is named for its larger bill. It has a bill depth that's 40% greater than some of the upland birds. Pusalula has a pale yellow underbelly, and Samuelis has a more crisp streaking and contrast. But if you step back and think about the size of this region, the fact that these birds have the ability to fly and mix with one another, how can they possibly be different at such fine spatial scales? Well, one idea is that morphological differences are seen, are driven by environmental differences. And within this small geographic region, these different subspecies are experiencing very different environments. The temperatures represent the average temperature of the hottest month, which varies drastically as you move inland. And we all know it's cooler on the coast, but then a lot warmer as you move inland. The salinity experienced by these birds is also highly variable from fresh water in the riparian zones that the upland birds are in, to nearly fresh in Sassoon Bay, then to extremely salty that's almost near seawater in the South San Francisco Bay. So take a moment to think about how different environmental variables might influence how species adapt and diversify and the high concentration of subspecies here might start to make a little bit more sense. And an interesting thing to note, um, the salt marsh in particular is one of the most challenging environments to live in. There are only 25 bird, mammal, and reptile species that can survive in salt marshes year round, and these song sparrows are one of them. That's because it's essentially a salty desert. Their sources of fresh water are extremely limited. It's very hot, it's constantly changing with the flux of the tides, it's remarkable that anything can really survive here full time. An animal in a salt marsh can't really find any fresh water at all. So some animals have developed a suite of adaptations that allow them and no one else to live here and occupy this niche. 
One of the most common adaptations for salt marsh animals is darker pigmentation, which helps them to camouflage to the dark mud. Um, this has been observed in foxes, mice, voles, terrapin snakes, and sparrows, where the salt marsh morphs are remarkably darker than their upland counterparts. So if we are just to focus on the differences between salt marsh and upland song sparrow subspecies, we now know that there are several key differences. Salt marsh birds have larger bill sizes, which allows an increased surface area for evaporative heat loss. It essentially helps them to keep cool in the hot summers in the salt marsh. They also have an increased salt tolerance. Birds in salt marshes actually have a greater surface area in their kidneys than upland birds. And they also have darker plumage, camouflage into the dark marsh mud. It's also hypothesized that darker plumage is a little bit tougher um, to allow them to survive a little bit better in the marsh. And these are all specialized adaptations that allow them to live in saltwater marshes. And the San Francisco Bay song sparrows in particular have been a subject of fascination among ornithologists for over a century, receiving detailed investigation into their morphological and behavioral differences from many different perspectives. Among the world's leading evolutionary biologists, these scientists were all drawn to studying the song sparrows of the San Francisco Bay. Grinnell and Miller are California's most influential ornithologists. Grinnell was the first director of the Berkeley Museum and dedicated his life to extensively studying California fauna. And with his student Miller, they put together the distribution of the birds of California, which is considered the most thorough state avifauna ever produced. And on the first page of this book is this plate of song sparrows pictured here on the right. It's the only bird illustration in the entire 600 page long book. So I think that they were quite fond of them. And why a fascination with these song sparrows? I think that, I mean, I wish I could ask them myself, but I think it's because we are witnessing the evolution of what could someday be new species that are inhabiting the same region. So with all this in mind, I wanted to see if these subspecies are different genetically. Until just recently, these birds were only classified by the way that they look, their morphological differences. And I was curious to see if these differences actually correspond with any genetic variation, the framework of what creates that. And so my most recent predecessors in the system sampled these birds in 1998 and 1999. Interestingly, around when I was born, um, Yvonne traveled all around the Bay Area during the summers, which is the breeding season, setting up mist nets and trapping birds to collect blood samples. The picture on the left is just an example of what a mist net looks like. Um, to capture birds, she would set up a playback call of a male sound sparrow singing, which would either attract a territorial male or an interested female who would get caught in the fine mesh of the net. She took a small blood sample, which is what we get DNA from, uh, took several measurements, and then set the birds free. And she used what we call microsatellite loci to examine population genetic structure, and overall found very low levels of divergence but a little bit of evidence that they might be different. And over the past 20 years, technology has advanced incredibly. And along with it, the cost of genetic sequencing has gone down too. So sequencing animal genomes is more accessible than ever before. So I was very lucky that I was able to do this as an undergraduate. And the blood that Yvonne collected 20 years ago was still preserved and available for me to use. So after many long days working in the lab, I ended up with sequences that I had to learn to analyze. So I used a method that we call DDRAD, which randomly samples across the genome of many different individuals to provide reduced representation sequences and identify places where they're different. So we match them all up and look at the differences. These regions are known as SNPs, or single nucleotide polyphones which just that at that location, at a single base pair, which is either an A, T, G, or C, their DNA codes for something different. And so I sequenced the partial genomes of 157 birds from six different subspecies that Yvonne collected, and that gave us over 2,000 SNPs to work with. And this is a very intensive process that requires preparing samples and extracting the DNA from blood, um, actually sequencing them, and an incredible amount of computing power to generate a series of letters that became my data. And all of the variation in all of those single base pair differences 
can be collapsed into two axes or principal components that allow us to better understand any population differences. So, and that allows us to basically better look at, to see if there's any population structuring. So here, each dot in this plot is a different bird and each color is a different subspecies. So take a moment just to think to yourselves, um, what do you all see here? I'll bring the map back in just so you can see how these groupings correspond. One thing that really jumps out to me is the separation is pulling apart from all the rest of the Pusalula birds or the Alameda song sparrow in the South San Francisco Bay. But even in this large swarm of points here, the colors are definitely grouping together in a way that is non-random. So I'll take away the map and put up another two axes. This is just another comparison looking at a little bit more variation. And here we see a split between the marsh birds in these blue colors and the upland birds in these red colors. So this is definitely showing that these birds are different from another, despite them being really close in, in geography. So based off of what we know about evolution, it only takes one migrant per generation to prevent divergence. It's truly remarkable that there's a noticeable amount of genetic differences in birds that live so close to one another. This is a pretty significant finding that's known as microgeographic variation, which is just a complicated way of saying that these birds are genetically different from one another at a very small geographic scale. So yes, these subspecies are different genetically. And that was really exciting, but I still had so many questions that were left unanswered. What makes them different? And are these differences meaningful in any way? So I went on to do some more sequencing. Specifically, I was interested to see if the morphological variation, how the birds were different, between these different subspecies could be explained by the genetic differences that we know exist. And if these were truly for adaptive functions, and if they were driven by differences in the environment. And so I decided to pursue a whole genome sequencing, which I was really excited to have the opportunity to do. And my first project, the DDRAD, went so smoothly that I was confident this was something I'd be able to do entirely in my senior year at Cornell. But it was far more difficult and far more tedious than I had ever expected. And I'm still working on the paper right now. And before I knew it, it was wintertime in Ithaca, my lab preparation for sequencing had already failed twice and I had to start over again. And this was really discouraging because I, was, I wasn't used to failing um, and it was really hard, but third time was the charm and I got it. And by sequencing the entire genomes of a smaller subset of birds, 43 birds this time, we ended up with even more data to work with. It was remarkable the difference. This time we got over 1.6 million SNPs, which is almost 600 times as many SNPs as the first method. And what makes this method really valuable is that we can actually match up specific genes with the variation that we observed. And so to discover regions and specific genes that may be important, we use what's known as a Manhattan plot, where significance is seen on the peaks in the data as they resemble a city skyline. The chromosomes of the genome are on the x-axis and each dot in this represents a single SNP. So there are over a million SNPs in this plot. And the y-axis is a measure of genetic diversity, which we call FST. So in this case, we're measuring the amount of population differentiation due to genetic structure between a salt marsh, between a salt marsh group and an upland group. And if we zoom into this peak in particular that I have in this red box, we find a gene called LGR4. And in birds, in birds, it happens to be that LGR4 deficiency results in smaller kidney size and may affect beak morphology. And this is a gene that jumps out when you compare a salt marsh and an upland um, grouping. And if you remember from before, the salt marsh birds have larger bill sizes. Maxillaris has a bill size that's about 40% greater than its upland counterpart, Gouldii. And then they also have an increased salt tolerance that allows them to live in the salt marsh. So this was really exciting and the hunting for genes was a lot of fun. So if we look at a separate pairing of salt marsh and upland subspecies, we see other peaks that were worth investigating too. The gene associated with this really tall peak here is called TYR, which plays a crucial role in determining the coat color of birds. 
And again, remember from the beginning, salt marsh birds have darker plumage than their upland birds. So this is all really exciting. And finally, we used what's called a redundancy analysis to see if there were any genotype environment associations. The main takeaway here is that environmental variables such as salinity, temperature, and precipitation, things that we know are highly variable across the Song Sparrow range in the San Francisco Bay area, are actually separating the subspecies seen in these clusters of points by their different habitat points. So back to our bluebirds and our redbirds example, what's occurring here is that habitat specific natural selection has likely played a role in making these populations different. The salt marsh birds have developed adaptations that allow them to be able to survive there in that very harsh environment. And the upland birds are better suited for their environment, even though these habitats are really close together. And even now, if mixing were to occur, the birds might not fare as well living in a habitat that's so different. And genetic diversity is one of several metrics that must be considered for conservation planning. Managers use genetic information from studies like this to determine the appropriate population groupings and priorities for conservation. Considering how close together these genetically and morphologically different populations are, it's especially important for managers to focus at an appropriate and possibly finer geographic scale than previously thought. If you were just to look at California as a whole, you would be missing all of the different subspecies differentiation that's occurring at these really small scales. These song sparrows from the San Francisco Bay have genetic variation that is explained by local adaptation to different environments. And this system really encapsulates where biological variation comes from. Right in your backyard is an example of natural selection at work. And this variation in the San Francisco Bay song sparrows exists nowhere else. Song sparrow evolution and diversification in the Bay Area has taken thousands of years and has been progressing ever since the first salt marshes in North America arose. This variation is fascinating, but it's also what conservation geneticists consider critical for long-term persistence, especially given the threats of climate change. And the San Francisco Bay Area has changed drastically over the past hundred years. Song sparrows have lost over 85% of their native habitat, and what's lost has also been fragmented into really small portions due to a history of diking and conversion of marshland to salt ponds, residential and industrial areas. And largely because of this, four of the five subspecies are listed as California subspecies of special concern. Even modest predictions of sea level rise would threaten the nesting and breeding grounds for these birds. Losing just one subspecies would be a huge loss for song sparrow diversity. So one thing that would be really important to help these song sparrows persist in the future and to not lose this aspect of diversity that's so unique um, would be to restoring some of the marshland. Uh, I know SFBBO is doing a lot for that. So thank you all for your efforts. And so I encourage you all to go out and enjoy these really special song sparrows. And I hope that you all will have a new appreciation for how fast saying these brands truly are. So thank you. I will now take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chloe. That was absolutely fascinating. And I know that I will definitely be spending more time appreciating our local song sparrows. So Chloe, we do have a question from Melanie. In all the maps you showed, there are no species shown in the East Bay. Is there a particular species or subspecies that resides in that area? Yes, so there is. Maybe the map wasn't quite clear. Let me pull it up to show you again. So the East Bay, it's assumed that there's Maxillaris is the subspecies that's there, which is um, also known as the Sassoon song sparrow. Right, and then probably the, like, going further south um, mm -hmm. towards, you know, images that you showed of Hayward and things like that, that's probably also the, the Alameda song sparrow there, too, I think. Right, in the, yeah. Cool. Awesome, thank you. And uh, let's see, we had a few more questions just come in. So I think Debbie and Dwight asked, do you know if they're, they sound different? Do their songs differ from each other? So I know that Songs Bear Song does vary across North America. I 
unfortunately have never seen these song sparrows in person. And I don't know if their songs differ. You all might know better than I do, um, but hopefully I'll see them soon and be able to report back. Yeah, definitely. When you move back out here, hopefully um, you'll be able to go and actually see the sparrows, make a trip up to, to the bay and escape some of the, the cool Monterey weather. <laughs> And then Patricia asked, is there a thought about why the Bay Area has so many subspecies in such a small area? Do you want to elaborate on that? Yeah, so that was basically the entire reason behind um, my thesis research, because it's so unusual that we have so many song sparrow subspecies in this tiny geographic region. And through all the different work, we've shown that it's not because they're far apart from one another, because they're close. Um, and it's not because of historic divergence times. Um, these song sparrows all evolutionarily diverged from one another at around the same time, but it's likely due to the fact that these are very different environments and the birds there have each colonized their own marsh and grown to be different from one another. So yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, thank you. For the driver behind all of this work and what's been driving ornithologists crazy for a century. Yeah, so interesting. And then Jan asked, are any of these recognized subspecies with their morphogenetic differences, are they being potentially considered as full species, do you think? Do you think they might be on their way towards that or are they similar enough? So not right now. I mean, the amount of genetic variation that we've observed is probably not consistent with what's usually described as different species, but that's also a really hot topic because sometimes in conservation, species that are in different places are split so that they can actually gain um, more environmental protections. So it's a tricky question. Um, and I think that either way, whether they're eventually one day have diverged even more to where they'd be considered full species or whether they remain subspecies of the song sparrow, it's diversity that exists nowhere else and should be preserved regardless. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And then Vivek said, awesome talk. Uh, do you have any other examples of microgeographic variation in other species? Yeah, there are several other examples. Um, one well-known one that has to do with foxes that live in different regions and also um, examples on different islands. Um, there are also fish that go into different streams, like different salmon and trout, um, that just always go back to their natal stream that become slightly different over time. Yeah, it's a really interesting um, question in um, evolutionary biology. Yeah, very cool. Uh, and then Chris asked, have you or ha do you know of anyone who's done any comparative research between our subspecies and those elsewhere in the US. So for example, um, the variant that affects bill size, you know, they're wondering, it, mm -hmm. is that also driving the differences with the Alaska subspecies? It's so great that you asked that because um, there, so my advisor, Jen Walsh, um, has studied differences between uh, many different sparrow sub species and subspecies. And there's a new graduate student at um, University of British Columbia named Catherine, and she's actually doing exactly what you just suggested. She's looking at um, specifically the Alaska birds and their differences from the San Francisco Bay. And I haven't talked to her yet, and I don't want to spoil any of the results, but it seems like they are very different, and I'm really excited to see what she finds out. So stay tuned and keep an eye out for her. Um, she's doing really incredible work. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have to make sure we get some updates on that. And then let's see, Eric asks, do the song sparrows drink the salt marsh water as it is, or do they have to travel up creeks to get less saline water? So it seems that they either avoid drinking the salt water, or drink the salt, or get most of their fresh water from the insects that they eat. Or, But really, they're living on like no fresh water at all, which is just... It's hard for me to believe. <laughs> yeah, it's incredible. Definitely another point for song sparrows and <laughs> appreciating where they are. Um, and then on a more personal note or uh, educational note, maybe, uh, Vayun asked, which undergraduate college in Cornell did you attend? 
So I was in the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences, and I studied animal science, which was very ag focused. Um, but I found my way through the lab of ornithology, which mostly hosts biology students, but they were willing to take me in and taught me everything about research and birds and evolution and biology. Yeah. Awesome. So anyone, it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully anyone who's thinking about attending will be able to join too. Um, and then Clay asked, are there any major diet differences that we know of between the subspecies? So I believe they're mostly just eating insects that live in their respective marshes. So I don't know if the insect populations vary. I would imagine that they're similar, but they might. Um, but I don't think that those, that their diets would be what's driving the differences in bill sizes. That's a follow-up question over there that correlates with diet. I think that the bill size has mostly been shown um, to be different related to being in that hot marsh. That's good. Yeah, and thank you, Yvonne, for that question too. And then Richard asked, do you know if the different subspecies interbreed successfully? So they can interbreed, which is how we have that um, putative hybrid subspecies, Santa Cruces. So they do, but it seems like for the most part, these um, adaptive differences that are so unique to their individual marshes are keeping these populations, um, at least gen genetically and phenotypically different. But there is still gene flow between the populations. It's just overpowered by other forces. And then closer to home for you, or asked, how do song sparrows in salt marsh environments on the East Coast survive? Might there be unique forms or subspecies there that are waiting to be discovered? That's a great question. So there are song sparrows in salt marshes on the East Coast, but I don't believe that they live there year round. Um, I think that the song sparrows of the San Francisco Bay are the only actual full-time residents. I think that the East Coast ones go in and out a little bit. Um, but there might be more on the East Coast that we have yet to discover, but um, nothing like this high concentration um, so far that's been described in the Bay. Wow, really interesting. And then Barbara says, great talk. What do you think lies behind the plasticity in song sparrows in comparison to other birds? So that is a great question. And I think to answer that question, we would have to bring birds in captivity and actually do a common garden experiment um, because that would be pretty difficult to um, actually assess with wild populations and see if there's the factors between plasticity and genetic diversity. That's, that's a great question. Yeah, and then Patricia asked, um, I guess, are the these processes driving song sparrow variation, might it be the same as those with uh, fox sparrow variation? So I do not know much about fox sparrows in particular, um, but with other sparrows that exist that have both salt marsh and upland population, it seems that there are similar processes that are driving that variation. Um, I'm not sure if it's going to look at fox sparrows in particular, um, but overall we think that it's similar, um, but it, it could be something that's different. And that's something that requires a lot of sequencing and time to go into um, looking at those differences. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, related, I guess, going back to in interbreeding between the subspecies, um, Jan asked, do you think you are getting the one migrant, one migrant between the subspecies and how much interbreeding between them do you think there is? So you mentioned that they can interbreed. Um, do you think there, there is a lot of that going on? So that's a great question. I wish that I was able to actually go out into the field and see if these birds are interbreeding because I don't know that. Um, but basically that theory is just a population genetics theory showing that that is the minimum amount of migration that would prevent um, divergence between species from happening. So I think there must be a little bit of interbreeding and we know that there's gene flow between them, but the main thing is that these adaptive differences and these, um, yeah, the, the adaptive differences are actually overpowering anything that might be homogenized by gene flow and birds moving back and forth. But it seems like these birds, they're very resident, they like to stay in their marshes and they don't like to move. And then uh, Yvonne asked, were you inspired by the grant's work mm -hmm. on 
Daphne Island. Are you familiar with that? Um, I'm familiar with some of the grants work. Um, I actually, I wasn't inspired by it because when I, I wish that I were, um, but when I started at Cornell and started working on these birds, I knew nothing about them. I knew nothing about evolutionary biology. Um, I actually, I went to Cornell without even realizing how big of a deal the lab of ornithology was. So I learned about that later on as I went on, but um, fortunately I was not inspired by it. But thanks for the question. Great. And then Sarah says, there's a song sparrow singing in my neighbor's yard right now in Berkeley. And is that the Alameda subspecies? Which I believe it is. I don't know where <laughs> my understanding of geography in California is very poor. Um, I don't know where Berkeley is. <laughs> yeah, they're they're going to be in that South Bay arm too. Oh, so yeah. Then yeah. Probably, yeah, if you're close to the marsh, yes. <laughs> nice. And then, um, do you know, uh, Clay asked, are there any breeding behavior differences between the subspecies? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know that they are separated in breeding. For the most part, they decide when to breed based off of changes in day length. So um, they start breeding in the summer months. And since they're all you know, living in relatively the same degrees of latitude, I would think that they aren't too influenced by that, but that's a good question. And then uh, Yvonne asked, do the California Channel Islands have subspecies like the ones you've described? They do. There is a Channel Island subspecies and there, I know there's, um, there are other island subspecies that are now actually extinct. Um, I'm blanking on what the names are in particular, um, but yeah, there are, or there were, depending on yeah. where they are. And then uh, Vivek asked, has anyone tried to draw the exact range boundaries between the subspecies, especially the three in the bay? Yes, um, that's actually here. Um, Catherine, the girl who's now working on um, the differences between the Alaskan and Pacific Northwest birds and the California birds, um, did this map for me, which is great. She's a whiz with mapping and was able to actually digitize the ranges that were historically drawn um, in some of the old maps. So yeah, you can, and a lot of the historic range has been constricted a lot because of development. Um, but you can see that, you know, these, the Alameda song sparrow is very closely restricted to the bay as is Samuelis and Maxillaris. And they really just live in those marshes. Whereas Gouldii, lives in this entire yellow block. So even though I put it up there kind of by point rays, Goldie Eye can't also be found further inland. And then you get the Santa Cruces song sparrow that's potentially a hybrid between the two. Um, but here Mani is the one that's um, further inland. So yeah, it's, it's hard to keep them all straight, but this is um, a representation of their ranges. Great, yeah. And that's actually a great um, example of showing where the Alameda song sparrow occurs. That's the entire, yeah, so Berkeley would be like right, probably just a little bit north of where that Pusalula uh, image is. So okay. yeah, part of that range. So that's what, uh, just to clarify for anyone who was confused, what we meant by the, the arms <laughs> of the bay, there were three yeah. major arms that are shown here. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, generally when we're thinking about Berkeley, we're thinking about this is East Bay and that's uh, okay. within the, the San Francisco Bay anyway. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, a little bit of a, a language thing there, but anyway. <laughs> I see people uh, putting that in the chat. Thank you. I'm embarrassed that I don't know, don't know the geography too well outside of these Song Sparrow ranges, um, and, but I'll learn it soon enough. And I'm, I'm a Stanford student, not a Berkeley student, so. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And then uh, Yvonne asked, what is the elevation that roughly separates the upland subspecies from the marsh ones? That is a good question. I don't know the exact elevation. I wish that I did, um, but there's definitely a big elevation gap. Um, I mean, we know that these coastal uplands are on bigger hills, and then there are also hills as you go inland, um, but obviously marsh is at sea level or below sea level. So there are big elevation differences. Um, that would be a good thing to put on a map too. And I'm sure, uh, yeah, a lot of that is also driven by vegetation differences and mm -hmm. things like that. Um, and then Debbie asked, how much does diet, if any, contribute to the coloration differences in plumage? 
I don't know. Um, it might. I I don't know if it, if it does or not. That is a great question. Um, you're giving me lots of different ideas that future um, undergrads and graduate students could do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then I guess I I think I remember you saying that generally the upland species look pretty similar to each other, and then right. the, the salt marsh mm -hmm. had some morphological differences. Do you have any ideas for what may, may be driving the differences just within the salt marsh subspecies? So we think that it's because they are really restricted to these bays and they have individually colonized three different arms of the bay and little mixing and um, diff slightly different bay conditions, just over time, um, they have diversified. And that's what's really fascinating about it is that we have these three replicate colonizations of salt marshes that have resulted in birds looking different, not looking the same. So that's a fascinating thing about evolution that um, because some of it's due to chance, things are different over time. Yeah, definitely. And then Yvonne asked, uh, do you know if there are any blood sodium differences potentially between the marsh and upland subspecies? Wow, that is another great question. That's something that we could do if we go and get a permit to go take blood samples from these birds. <laughs> <laughs> um, from Yvonne, uh, do you plan to look at the skins collected by Grinnell when you come here to the Bay Area? So that is actually a great question. Um, Jillian Dittner, who did the illustrations for my talk um, and for this project as a whole, we actually had some of Grinnell's skins mailed to us at Cornell so that she could um, have a better model for doing her illustrations. And I got to see them when they arrived. and. It was just, it was amazing to see them because the Lab of Ornithology has a lot, but the um, museum there just has, you know, all of the California ones that he originally collected. And those were really special to see, especially being birds from over a hundred years ago. So I'll have to see them at Cal in California too, and all the other ones. Awesome, yeah, definitely. You'll have so much to explore when you get here. Right. <laughs> Uh, well, again, thank you so much, Chloe, for your wonderful presentation, and thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight. Chloe, is there anything else you want to say to everyone before we all sign off? Just thank you so much for your attention and all of your great questions. Uh, I really appreciated this. If I were continuing, if I didn't have um, my PhD advisor is here, and if I didn't have a lot of work on Blue Tuna to do, I'd have a list of questions to do for Song Sparrows. So I really appreciate it. And uh, my contact information, my email is listed there. If anyone wants to email me with any follow-up questions, I'd be happy to chat. Mm -hmm.